hopefully everyone can make it in. Um, Melissa, if you can keep an eye on the um, the event page chat, I'm I just don't think I have a everything up here. So Sorry. if there's anything in there that I'm not seeing, um, just let me know. Okay, well done. Okay, you can go ahead and start recording. All right, ready to go. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Adderhold. I work at the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology um, in the Instrumentation Services Directorate uh, through the headquarters in Washington, DC. Uh, this SIG, the Special Interest Group meeting, is um, collecting geophysical observations from the seafloor slash marine. Sorry, I want to capture. There's also other parts of the ocean in there that we can get geophysical observations from. But um, this uh, SIG was sort of born out of the last year's SIG that focused on instrumentation when it was identified um, through our discussions that there's also some very um, important issues to be resolved in our community um, in regards to data. And so we thought we'd do a follow-on um, SIG in this workshop um, addressing these these questions more from the data side, although you will be hearing about instrumentation as well. This, you know, there's of course many issues that are interrelated with those two. So we'll start um, with just some sort of uh, ground rules and an introduction to to this. Um, the goals, of course, are we're going to be um, helping to inform the community of the current facilities, resources, and data centers and their roles in the seismic and geodetic community. Uh, we'd like to discuss future community needs for seafloor and marine geophysical data, for example, large volume data, um, consistent metadata, that sort of thing. And we'd like to also identify areas along this seafloor to research paper pipeline where we can improve this process, um, whether it's in data access, data products, um, data archiving, um, data attribution, that sort of thing. So. So hopefully we can accomplish those goals in this time. We'll go ahead and um, have some presentations first and then follow that with some discussion using um, Jamboards to kind of collect some, some thoughts from the community and priorities and that sort of thing. Um, if we end up not needing to use all the time, we'll, we'll go ahead and end early, um, but we'll just kind of forge on through this. And of course, the recording will be available later on if you have to step away. For Zoom etiquette, uh, please make sure your real name shows up in the participant list. You can rename yourself um, if you do not have your real name on there. Please mute your microphone when not speaking. Uh, since we're in a smaller session, you can turn on your camera. Um, uh, but if you're having any bandwidth issues, you can turn that off. Uh, there are closed captions available. Um, if you need any help with that, please ask Melissa, who is helping us here as a facilitator and use the uh, virtual platform chat box on that event page instead of the Zoom chat, but we'll be monitoring both just in case. Any questions, concerns, comments so far? Right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and start with our first presentation, uh, which will be given by um, David Schmidt. And I'll get your slides up here in a minute, David. And... All right, good afternoon, everybody. So I just wanted to update uh, the community on the activities and discussions that have been going on in the past year in the C4 GDEC community. Um, and I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Andrew Newman. You can move to the next slide there. So just to remind people, back in 2019, NSF commissioned a C4 geodetic instrument pool. Uh, this was a five and a half million investment by NSF um, in a set of instruments that could be used by the community for C4 geodetic experiments. And that pool consists of the equipment for 16 GNSS acoustic sites. Those sites would also include an absolute pressure gauge along with them. And then three liquid robotic wave gliders that uh, would be used to collect those data. So over the past two years, Scripps has been commissioning that instrumentation and, and testing it. The wave gliders are going through final um, trials right now. In fact, the next month they'll go through some C trials. And the, the plan is for all that equipment to be ready for the community by the end of this year. 
Um, as part of the commissioning, uh, NSF only provided money to buy and test the equipment. There was no money for the deployment, operation, maintenance, or training on the equipment. So that is something that the community needs as a next step that community needs to work on and motivated uh, the discussions that have been going on in the past year. Next slide. So over the past year, year and a half, there have been um, a series of meetings, webinars, as well as a workshop to kind of organize the community and discuss how exactly we wanted to utilize these equipment and also thinking about the future. What do we see for ourselves in the future? And uh, so we, we culminated all those webinars with a, a virtual workshop back in April. It was a three-day workshop. There were um, about 165 participants who registered for the workshop. And of those participants, about 70 were, or would describe themselves as early career. Um, and so the goals for the workshop were to bring the GDATA community together, to seek feedback from the community of how we wanted to use the instrumentation that's in the pool, uh, what might be appropriate targets for instrument, instruments in the pool. Uh, we also wanted to discuss how we might um, grow the C4 GDATA community in both an equitable and inclusive way. And finally, we want to discuss what are the technologies that exist and what are the opportunities for the future that we should be thinking about within C4 Geodesy. As part of that, um, of that virtual meeting, we also solicited white papers from the community to get kind of individual ideas uh, on paper. And uh, all of the materials from the workshop and those white papers and past presentations are found at the website cfloorgeodesy.org. So if you're interested in hearing about a lot of those ideas, I encourage you to go to the website. Next slide. So we're in the process right now of finalizing the workshop report. Uh, there was a, a workshop writing committee uh, and that committee has been working over the summer to, to develop that, that report, that summary from the workshop. Um, and that report um, should be ready for the community to look at at the end of August, at the end of the summer. So we're hoping to get feedback from the participants as to regards to that workshop soon. Um, and basically that workshop report talks about what are the science um, needs of the community that motivates the need for C4 genetic instrumentation. Uh, that workshop report will also detail um, what are the mechanisms for and ideas for using the instruments in the pool. Um, the need for a larger facility and staff to actually manage and operate the equipment in the pool. Um, the workshop report also talks about recommendations for a steering committee and how we need a steering committee to help guide us through the future and the future. Uh, the workshop report also discusses what are some of the, the data standards and metadata standards that are needed for C4 genetic data and what should be kind of the data policy uh, for data collected through instruments in the pool. And finally, the, the report um, also provides recommendations of how we can build a diverse uh, community within the c 4 GDA community. So the, the next step is to uh, release that workshop report, get feedback on that workshop report, and then pass that along to NSF. And then finally, the community now needs to organize again to start making specific plans on how we want to use the instrumentation in the pool, since that equipment will be available to us very soon. And so I'll, I'll stop there and happy to take questions or open to discussion later on. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, are there any questions? If you have questions, you can raise your hand and unmute or um, post those in the event page chat. I guess I have a question, David. Um, so in terms of it being available to the community and then that last point on developing community plans, is, so is it envisioned that from the get-go, these will be used in a sort of a, a community experiment kind of mode or are they envisioned that maybe they would also be available for actual PI proposals or is that still part of, part of the planning and discussion? I think that's part of the ongoing discussion that was discussed quite a bit at the workshop in terms of getting people's feedback. And there were different perspectives that were voiced, but I would say from the, the majority of voices and also the results from our poll that we did following the workshop, 
the majority of the community felt strongly that a community experiment was the most appropriate way to use those equipment to train the community to allow broad participation and to make the data available to everybody. Um, so yeah, there were a range of ideas that were expressed on that front. Great, any other questions for David? I don't see anything in the chat, so I think we'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation, which will be Jerry Carter. So let me just get those slides up. Sorry, <laughs> trying to do too many things. That's okay. There you go. That should be good. There we go. Thank you, Casey. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview about the data that we have at the Iris DMC. This is a map of all of the stations that we have uh, recorded in the in uh, that we have data for the DMC. And if you go to the next slide this is the we have actually uh, over 2000 stations obs ip stations in the dmc which is a, a considerable amount and in fact if you go to the next slide we show that uh, i have these are all the categories we have a little bit over 700 uh, terabytes of data in the in the dmc and if you can look at the the, the sort of brownish or or reddish color down that includes the OBS IP. So it is an, not an insignificant amount of data that goes into the DMC from the OBS community. Um, looking a little bit to the future, I mean, we're starting to get uh, data coming in from, from wave gliders and, and mermaids and so forth. And this is a particular challenge for us because normally we're seismic stations which are tied to a particular point on the on the earth and so in looking at our new system that we're developing with UNAVCO um, that is a combined sage and gauge uh, geodetic seismic um, facility to to provide all of this information we have gone to a um, we're starting to look at well how do we actually combine all of that information and using formats and protocols and data storage uh, mechanisms that, that allows us a lot more flexibility. So for example, if we go to the next slide, we're, we're putting data or we'll be putting data in containers. And this is the, the CCP, if, if nobody has heard about it, is the common cloud platform that we're developing um, it should be, we're, we're working on, on, on system development right now, but one of the main parts of this is that it gives us a lot of flexibility in the types of data that we contain, and we'll put it in a common data container, and um, we're thinking about using sensor ML as our metadata storage mechanism or being able to deliver it. And one of the nice things about sensor ML is it does allow for moving platforms. And so we can put things in like uh, mermaids and, and wave gliders so, so that it's a little bit more amenable to the information that is coming out of the, uh, the seafloor community or the ocean community. So that, that will at least give us a lot more flexibility in handling that kind of data. Now we do have some challenges. In fact, if you hit the, uh, just hit your return, that's supposed to have, a, yeah, there we go. So we have a mermaid inside of our container. Um, <clears throat> looking to the future, we're, we're, and I know that this is coming up, uh, particularly in the seafloor community is the use of the, um, DAS, and that, of course, will generate all kinds of information and data. It's a huge challenge for us because it's a tremendous amount of data uh, at, at high sample rates, and we're trying to figure out how to use that, what kind of products might be um, useful to the community from that. So how do we store it? How do we distribute it? Do we um, and, and put it in a place where you could actually process it, maybe 
closer to where the data are rather than trying to download um, terabytes and terabytes of data, hundreds of terabytes of data to your, your own facility so that you can do your own processing. So it, it is a challenge, but we are working on it through the the SIG, the DAS SIG that's been going on, or um, excuse me, the RCN. And um, hopefully we'll have some, some uh, solutions for that. It'll give us some common uh, metadata uh, and which we then can put into this versatile uh, container that gives us the flexibility for our data types. So that's about all I had to, to say about this, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. Thank you, Gary. Questions from the audience? Or the other speakers? I have a quick question. Um, how how has the industry um, data, like um, I know that there's some op um, industry data sets starting to be opened. Maybe they're no longer as useful for exploration and that sort of thing, but still very useful for scientific purposes. Have, have there still been um, the same number of those kinds of um, opportunities out there? Or have, have people continued to approach the DMC to host? large data sets like that? Um, well, we haven't gotten a whole lot of uh, industry data coming in yet. It's It would be a huge problem if they decided to open up all of their archives and, and make sure that we could, everybody could have access to it. Um, it's a, it's a one of the, it's the large data challenge that we're, we're facing with DAS, with uh, some GNSS, high sample rate GNSS data. Um, and and of course the this massive store of reflection data and and uh, refraction data that that industry has that they might be thinking about re, um, loosening up. But I think there's been some movement in the past to try and do this, and I don't. While there may might be some um, some desire to do it. I don't think anything has really gone too far as far as releasing this data. And I know that there's some sessions in AGU coming up this, this year that are addressing that and, and the possibilities of that. So how we deal with that is yet to be known, but the formats and the, 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 uh, the way the storage of it is, will hopefully be solved by the time if, if, and when that happens, we should be able to handle it. It's a it's a matter of money. Mm -hmm. Where where can you come up with the money to store all of that data and then provide easy access to it? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, okay, we've got a question um, for you again, Jerry. Um, is Sensor MT going to be including all types of metadata for all types of data? Active, passive, seed, seg y, das. GPS. Um, it, we we sort of look at sensor ML as a as a basis for doing it. So we would we would take a subset of that and form that, and we would want to to search in a geospatial sense. We would have some that's common to almost to all of the data we have, and then we would have specialized parts that might be based on the sensor ML. And of course, we could then produce a sensor ML compliant metadata to send to somebody if we wanted to or even store it internally but how we store it internally and what we what we export it will depend on what the community needs actually yeah we'll want to we, we need to satisfy what the community needs and we'll probably store things internally in a way that will will allow us to do that and sensor ml is one of the things that at least it is a, a standard that's being used um that that seems to satisfy all of the needs of the metadata from, from almost all of the geophysical platforms that we have. Great, thank you. Well, I don't see other questions. Any hands up? Nope, I think we're good. Okay, I think we'll move on because we'll certainly have more time for discussion. And um, if you have more questions for Jerry, there's there's opportunities for that. 
So I'll bring up the slides for the next presentation, which will be um, Jim Garrity. Uh, let's just. Ready. Okay. All right. Thanks, Casey. Um, and yeah, I, I guess uh, I'm kind of a last minute addition to uh, this SIG. I think uh, the Woods Hole group was hoping to be here themselves and they've been uh, extremely busy <laughs> with uh, with a, an, act, an ongoing experiment up in the Pacific Northwest with uh, just completed a short period experiment and now going out with the broadband. So I think they uh, none of them were able to make it today. So I kind of put together just a few thoughts and comments to, I think, Within, within this uh, community, for the most part, a lot of people are familiar with, with OPSIC, the, the Ocean Bottom Seismology and Instrumentation Program, or center. And, um, and so uh, I didn't wanna go into a lot of detail here, but I thought I would at least try to, try to make sure everybody involved in, in the SIG today was kind of aware of, of what OPSIC is and, and kind of how it operates and what it offers. And, uh, and then we can, we can go on with the discussion from there. Um, so OPSIC is an NSF funded facility that has been in one form or another around uh, or on the order of uh, a little over 20 years now. And so it's a well-established facility that, that provides OBS instrumentation to the community for a wide variety of uses, um, you know, both, both traditional broadband instrumentation as well as instrumentation that's specifically designed for so-called active source experiments, for example, or higher frequency experiments. And the current uh, motive of OBSIC is it's entirely centered at the Woods Hole Ocean, uh, Oceanographic Institute and uh, will be for the next few years at least. And I think most of us expect, hopefully, it will continue on from there. Um, and I encourage anybody who wants sort of detailed information on instrumentation, the process by, under which you make requests, the types of support that's available for proposals, those types of things are all pretty well established. There's, there's guidelines for, for PEIs, there's guidelines for users, and there's information on data that you can find at, that, uh, at this website here, opsic.hui.edu, and I encourage you guys to go look into that. Um, one thing that I thought I would definitely take the time to mention is that there is, you know, like a lot of uh, these kind of facility type endeavors, there is a community input framework and the OPSIC um, operations subcommittee is the uh, most recent incarnation of that. And it's a little bit different than it's been in the past. So I thought it was important to kind of point it out. We um, are now embedded within NSF has kind of shifted the this sort of uh, community input role into the UNALS framework. And specifically the Marine Seismic Research Oversight Committee is a, is a longstanding committee that's advised UNALS, the, the, who operates the ships, on um, operation of, of for, seismic, uh, for seismic experiments, pr predominantly through the seismic research vessels like currently the, the Langseth. Um, they've kind of broadened the, the, the footprint of that committee, so to speak. And we are a subcommittee independent of that committee. We sort of do our own operations, but we sit within that committee and sort of hopefully provide a little more integration within, within the, um, the broader marine seismic community and the marine geophysical community. And um, we've only, <laughs> we sort of were formulated just before COVID. And so it's been a little slow really ramping up in terms of really being able to do a lot of face-to-face -face activities. But we have had a, uh, one in-person meeting and several online uh, shorter meetings that have, have accomplished a few things that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, the current membership of that committee is here. I, I happen to chair it right now. Iris um, uh, Casey is, is, uh, is, has been a member of that committee since its inception. It represents uh, people both from the more traditional broadband community as well as from the active source community. And we, and we try to, to, to keep a broad, uh, a broad perspective on the kinds of science people wanna do with this, this, this type of experiment. So if you're interested in this community, if, you're, if you have questions about, uh, about how it works and what some of the issues are, I encourage you to, to reach out to any of the people on this list because they'll be happy to, to talk to you about it. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Casey. All right, so John sort of, I think if he had been here, John Collins, the, the, the PI at, Wood, at Woods Hole, he would have kind of given you a, a, a kind of an update and summary on, on all the activities that they've been able to do there. And, I, and I'm not really able to do that um, at, 
it for you. So I, I th think I wanted to just summarize some of the kind of the main points that and, and activities that they've been really involved in as as they've built up over the last couple of years this uh, this new framework for the OBSIC program. Um, Number one, I think an incredibly challenging year for anybody trying to, as you all know, for anybody trying to actually go out and collect data uh, was that COVID really impacted seagoing operations a lot. Despite that, there were some really critical experiments. Seafloor, <laughs> there was instrumentation on the sea floor that had to be recovered. And so we really had to move forward with doing operations despite um, the restrictions associated with COVID. And, and that was a real, the, 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 I have to give give a lot of props to the, uh, the Woods Hole OBS group because the requirements on them for the amount of quarantine coming and going from Massachusetts, the quarantines that was required before you could get on a ship, and then just the activities and the limitations of the activities on the ship. It was an, it was an incredibly um, time consuming and stressful process to even do an, a, a given individual's experiment to say nothing of them having to do this back to back over the course of the last year and a half. And they did a really pretty remarkable job of being able to piece all that together and get done what needed to get done. Um, in terms of the broader sort of state of the, of the program and state of the fleet, um, I think there's been a lot of discussion in the last year or two that a lot of this equipment is really aging very, very significantly. Um, some, some, of the, some of the equipment actually dates back to near the beginning, to, to the beginning of that program over 20 years ago and uh, has been deployed hundreds dozens to hundreds of times, depending on the type of instrumentation on the seafloor. And so um, it really is in need of recapitalization. So there's been a lot of focus and discussion on how best to do that. Um, the other component of this is that it's been a remarkably successful component and in that there's really a, a very significant demand for the instruments. And so there's just now a significant wait time in particular for the broadbands, which typically are deployed for a year or more. And so um, experiments that are being funded now are sort of pushed out to 2023 or 2024, maybe even. Um, before they're going to actually be able to be deployed, and that's that's certainly not a situation we like to have for a healthy a healthy program. And I think in addition, the the, the um, current state of the pool for active source instruments is really limited to only thirty instruments that are at Woods Hole. The rest of the instruments, if you want to do a bigger, more typical active uh, source experiment, we need to subcontract um, with other providers of those instruments, and that's not a very that's again not a very uh, just not a very sustainable way to, to maintain the pool. So for a variety of reasons, there's really a, a need to uh, improve on the instrumentation as well as um, expand the numbers of it in some cases to, to, really, to really do the science we wanna be able to do. And so for that reason, our uh, one of the activities that our subcommittee put together was to produce a white paper that kind of outlined we, we felt like the broad community support for a refurbishment of this fleet. And I've got a link there um, that you can see for that, for that uh, report. It sits in the UNALS or the subcommittees kind of part of the UNALS website. Um, in addition, I think Casey might be able to put it up. Hopefully we can share it in the files or something that's here. I, 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 I sent it over. So hopefully there's a, a chance you guys can actually go into the file section and just grab it. Or I, I guess she just posted the link in the chat. So there you go. Um, so that was to, to sort of the community framework. Uh, on the Woods Hole side, they kind of responded to those pressures and those needs. They submitted a full MSRI proposal. They were put at pre-proposal, were invited to put in a full proposal. So we're successful at that level. I frankly have not heard the outcome of that. I think they're starting to hear outcomes. There may be an outcome. I have not heard what that is. In addition, many of you know that there's been a big community effort to try to build up the so-called SC4D initiative, subduction zone, 4D initiative. And they also submitted a major MSRI proposal that included really fundamentally new instrument designs that would incorporate um, seismic instrumentation within it on the seafloor. And so Woods Hole contributed as a subcontractor or, or a subawardee to that proposal. I think I have heard that proposal was declined this time, but I think the, 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 the plan moving forward is certainly that new kinds of instrumentation um, are going to be needed to really accomplish what what the community wants to do with SC4D, and um, and and HUI and and the OBSIC program can can try to help play a a role in helping get that that instrumentation developed and and implemented in a way that that, that will be beneficial to the community. And then the last kind of thing to just keep them busy was that NSF underwent a midlife review for the program uh, this spring, and so that that 
uh, provided a lot of uh, a lot of feedback to their operations and uh, a little bit of feedback even to our committee operations and uh, generally it's been very supportive of, of the program that they've spun up there and and provided some uh, guidance and recommendations for helping helping move the program forward over the next couple of years. And then I think the last point, I think an important point for, for this conversation about data is, you know, as, as Jerry pointed out, there is uh, all of the OBS data, increasingly even the, the, the short period experiment, uh, active source data is recorded in seed initially, and so, or mini seed. And so all of those data are, being, are now being offered through, uh, moving forward through the, the IRIS DMC and that underscore OBSIP, confusingly a P instead of a C. Um, the old uh, terminology was the is the virtual is the virtual uh, uh, network code for that. You can find all past uh, OBS data that that's uh, in in that seed format there or mini seed format. And um, one of the efforts that Woods Hole is undergoing is is they brought in and hired a data specialist, Andrew Barkley, who many of you know, a longtime member of this community. Um, has moved has moved there and is is helping them develop some new, um, effectively I would I would say some some data products that we're kind of kind of moving forward with some community wishes with with upgrading the, the data as it's archived to the DMC and a, a very basic one but a very important one that I think is the first one that they've been working on is to formally implement a, a mechanism to include orientations of the instruments historically. The data is released without orientations, and the PIs have to figure that out. Um, there's the, the the community has supported this kind of be happening at the at the at the level of the the data being submitted to the DMC, and so that's the first step that they're implementing. But there's a few other uh, steps along the way that they're they're I think they're they're planning to try to implement, including things like noise uh, noise reduction uh, tools and things like that. So maybe I'll stop there. And happy to take any questions. Happy to participate in this conversation more broadly. But um, I, 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 hopefully that gave everybody sort of a, a, an overview and framework of where the program is at right now and kind of where it's looking to go in the future. Thanks very much, Jim. And yes, I appreciate that you were able to step in on this because I know, um, yes, the Huey folks have at OBSIC have been <laughs> very, very busy. And Crazy. Take, and some of them are taking some very, very much needed time off. So, um, so we're glad to have this update. Um, any questions for Jim about um, OBSIC? I don't know if you can answer this as just a quick, quick question, but um, I assume that because there's um, sort of this delay in, in the schedule for, um, for research cruises uh, because of the, the need for quarantining and, and so on, is there still, um, a pretty healthy uh, level of, of instrument requests coming in for, for this? I think this is probably a John question, but I'm, it is I'm a curious John. to know. Yeah, it is a John question. Certainly it has been healthy. Um, as of the last report that I saw, which was uh, six or eight months ago, it had continued on and was healthy. And I think, you know, the reality is that um, People, I think, are are anticipating as we come out of COVID the opportunity to really do some new experiments, and so I, I don't think proposals are down at NSF, and my guess is OBS proposals are no different. Um, so, so, I, so I suspect the demand is only increasing, and um, and and because unfortunately, because of some of the delays, some of the experiments, for example, there was one experiment that was hoping to get out this spring, and all these delays actually has pushed that back to the fall, and that has a has a, a cascading effect because it then pushes back everything that that's already in the queue behind it. So mm -hmm. for the broadband instruments in particular, um, it's definitely going to take, I think, uh, a little bit of time to get through the backlog that is uh, that is accumulated. Mm -hmm. And I think on that note, though, still um, as putting on my oversight committee <laughs> hat, um, please continue to request instruments. Please continue to propose. Um, you know the the. Um, Obviously, there's there is the delays in scheduling, but the need, the community need, is demonstrated in those requests. So, um, if you need that kind of observation to advance your research, please continue to propose. Um, I think uh, Doug Weens had a question that was sort of related to that, so I'm just going to get that in really quick. Um, can you comment on wait times for instruments and the prospect of building instruments? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> both are. <laughs> Huge questions. I don't, 
the, the, the wait times one should be easy at this point. I don't know it just because I haven't gotten an update from John in several months. And so I honestly don't know where things stand. And, and it's a traditional problem a little bit within OPSIP, not a problem, um, but there's nothing gets officially put on the schedule until OPSIC is told from NSF officially that something has been funded. And so there can sometimes be recommendations of funding, but that information doesn't necessarily get passed in a really efficient way. And so um, I think even John sometimes, you know, can be surprised by when when all of a sudden something something is into the queue where he didn't realize it was there. And so um, the last I saw, I'm pretty sure we were looking at definitely through 2022 was 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 booked. And then and when I say booked, you know, there may be a handful of instruments available, but some of the some of the projects that have been funded, I know one of them uses there's approximately a maximum of 100 broadbands really available to the community broadly. And um, a few of the experiments have been funded. One uses about 50 and the other two use about 30. So, you know, kind of right there, you sort of see that um, even if uh, if you're not much above that threshold, actually getting the puzzle pieces to fit together is a significant issue. And so things can get delayed by another year, for example, if they, if, if they can't quite fit in what they really need. And so um, I think they work hard to try to, to be flexible and, and move those puzzle pieces around as best they can. Um, I'm kind of talking around the issue, but I wouldn't be surprised if we'd see 23, 24. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a really great question on the prospect of building instruments. You know, we have, great hopes of using the MSRI program to try to refurbish this, this, this program. There's a lot of support within OCE and MG and G within OCE to, to help make that happen. I think it's clear that the, the active source community desperately would love a, a coherent pool of instruments, a hundred that they could use simultaneously to do their experiments rather than deploy 20 or 30 at a time and picking up and move them and extend their ship time and their experiment length before for that reason. Um, and with the broadbands, it really is actually a, a quality and um, yeah, the, the instruments working well, that, that's an issue. It's, it's not necessarily that we need a lot more than a hundred, but we just need to, them all to really work and work in a way that doesn't require a huge amount of labor and effort on the part of the facility to refurbish every instrument every time they deploy it on the seafloor and then need to redeploy it. And that's become a huge cost for, for Hui, and it's become a, a somewhat of a slowdown even potentially in the deployment is that it, it really takes a long time to rebuild a girl that's 20 years old to get it back on the seafloor because that's all you've got to work with. So that that OPSIC, that, uh, that MSRI is a big card to play and they've they've made one play and we'll see, uh, it may take a couple tries, but we really hope that that's a mechanism to do this. In between, you know, one of the, one of the comments that came back from the community group that did the review that John shared with me, the NSF review was, you know, okay, we need to be trying to think about some other mechanisms too, just because that may take too long. And there are definitely ways that, that, they, that there are um, smaller amounts of funds. They're reaching out to, I think the uh, instrumentation program within MG and G has smaller amounts of funds to try to, to, for example, they're building, I think 16 new broadband OBSs that utilize some instruments that they got from the TA program, the, the Trillium 240 instruments. And so those would be nice broadband instruments to bring into play. They have to be modified to be put on the seafloor. There's expen expenditures associated with data loggers. So it's not free, but you try to leverage other funding opportunities to make that happen. And, and I know Woods Hole has been working on, on those specific 16 and they have a few other mechanisms that they're trying to put in place to replace the, for example, the, 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 the original Hui broadbands, which are these ones that have the GURLPs that are, that are kind of beyond end of life. And so I think there's some different mechanisms. You try to piece it all together, but the reality is to really do something of the scale of say, build a new short period fleet. You know, it was a $20 million proposal that John put in to do both the short period fleet and the broadband fleet. You know, I think his hopes would maybe one or the other would get funded, but um, you know, we'll see. I, th I think it'll be interesting to see what the feedback is on that proposal. Thank you, Jim. And I think that answered one of the questions, which was what is the R&D budget for building instruments now in that there's, you know, some small initiatives, but the big ones yeah. are 
just proposals at this point. And That's right. The, the program itself is funded to do operations. That's it. There is there is no there is no instrumentation. There is no development. If you even want to think about what it is, then John sort of needs to do that on time associated with other activities. Okay, thanks, um, Megan. I'm sorry you've had your hand up for a while. There, do you want to? Yeah, you? just a quick question. You mentioned orientations. I, I assume you mean of the horizontals. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so that those aren't typically provided in the C metadata. No. So um, this has a, been a long-standing confusion in the community um, going back years. But yeah, the, 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 we have no control on, on the, the instrument as it deploys. And um, historically, it was sort of, since it is effectively a derived product that has a, can have very large uncertainties associated with it, the decision was made that it shouldn't be put in there to be potentially misused by individuals. And so individuals will collect the data and they'll see that the orientations don't make any sense. In fact, in the metadata, it's, they both just say zero. The east and north both say zero. And so there, there can be no way to misunderstand that uh, the instrument was actually oriented when it wasn't. And um, it, it, it allows for, you know, the tools are, are now out there pretty, pretty broadly for different mechanisms to do that. And so I think most PIs have been fine with that process. It does make it more difficult for users to come in and collect that data. And all of a sudden they wanna do some S waves and there's, there's the, the data aren't oriented. They didn't even know that. How do they go through that process of doing it? And so the community has definitely pushed back and said, okay, you should do something when you can. And so I think, you know, Casey was very involved in this effort when Cascadia was built to, to build up those tools to actually do it for the Cascadia data. And um, we, OBSIC is now moving forward with a program to implement those kinds of tools for the all data sets that they collect. That unlike say Pascal, they're responsible for submitting the data to the DMC. The PIs are not. All the data is handled by the OBSIC group. And so when they do that data handling, they will do those orientations and submit those orientations with the data when they when they put the seed, mini seed and, and supply the metadata to the DMC. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. And I think if we can answer two quick questions mm -hmm. <laughs> um, on OBSIC, uh, collaborations with international partners and agencies, maybe that's kind of related to like in, in the meantime, while we don't have the built instruments, um, are there ways that OBSIC is collaborating? That's a good question. I think historically the U.S. has had kind of the biggest and most active pool. And so you would find individual PIs that would figure out how to, you know, individual PIs would, would collaborate with, with uh, yeah, with partners in other countries that would make use of, of other pools. Um, it is, it, there's sort of a little bit of a change happening right now in our own backyard in, in the context of Canada is building their first pool. And they really have invested sort of a, in a similar scale to what uh, the MSRI um, was, is hoping to accomplish. Invested in about a hundred, over a hundred, I think, 120 or something um, broadband instruments that will be used that are simple deploy, used for both active and passive type of experiments. And um, I know that the, in, at that pool, they are somewhat concerned about the fact that they're investing a lot up front, but they don't have a big user group for this yet. And so they're actually worried that, that it may be that there's not as much demand for the instruments, even as they, as they build them and invest in all this and, and how to spill, spin up the effectively the, the proposal support in Canada to be able to actually make use of the facility in the way they'd like to do it. And so I think they very much would, uh, would be open to sort of partnerships that might be a little more formal within the groups. It's, they're still in a, in a very early in a build mode. And so it's kind of premature to, to get too far down that road, especially since we don't really know what our build opportunities are gonna be. But I definitely think that there's gonna be opportunities in the future for the US and the Canadian pool to maybe more formally support each other for experiment needs when their own experiment needs are not making full use of their pool. We'll see how that actually plays out. I'm not speaking for NSF in that in any way. I'm speaking much more just from the kinds of conversations that have been happening in the community and, and I know between the facilities. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great example. 
Um, and then one last question, um, what are the prospects of using seafloor dark fiber DAS as part of OBSIC program? Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's been a, a question that's actually been not in the DAS level um, necessarily, um, but just tapping into cables and, and deploying instruments on them has been, a, been part of the community discussion for a long time. And in fact, the H2O site, which you can operate it for about two years, I think you can find uh, in the DMC and that that was a, an instrument that operated on an, an old cable that was donated. Um, I think it's much more of a community discussion right now in terms of the advocates of those tools are, you know, I think really trying to push forward in, in, in trying to explore the, the potential of them and in different ways to take advantage of them. And, you know, OPSIC is, as it's structured is pretty rigid, as I mentioned, it's basically just operation of an existing instrument pool and there's not really a, a funding mechanism within it to be exploring and pushing outwards. And so I think it's mainly gonna be the community pushing to get these kinds of things embedded within in a, in a, in a systematic way, rather than OPSIC being able to drive it themselves. It's gonna to have to be a community level initiative to, to, to expand in those kinds of directions, I think. Thank you. And I think we will go ahead and move on, but I really appreciate um, those answers to those questions and, and for the questions themselves. Thanks everyone for participating. Um, so I think we'll move on to our last presentation um, before we get into our discussion period. And so I'll bring up slides for James Lindsay uh, from Garalp. And great. James? Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James Lindsay. Uh, I work for Growout Systems Limited. And today, um, a bit of a last minute edition. Um, so I'm just going to give a short presentation on the Aquarius OBS system. Um, following on from Jim's point earlier, uh, this is the OBS that is being supplied to um, Canada's OBS fleet. Um, so Sorry, Casey, the uh, slides are a little bit odd on this one. So if you could just go to the next slide and skip forward about five or six times just to get the labels up. So the sensor inside of the Aquarius system um, is closely related to a land-based uh, seismometer we produce called the Certimus. Um, this is a broadband seismometer with a flat frequency response between 120 seconds and 100 hertz. Um, and has a, a new, unique digital feedback system that allows it to be operational at plus minus 90 degrees. Um, the OBS system itself has an annular shape to minimize interference from currents to give it a low profile. Um, but it also includes an acoustic modem system that allows for um, some transfer of seismic data to the surface um, whilst the OBS system is deployed autonomously. Um, next, please, Casey. Thank you. Um, so the system as standard comes with a, an auxiliary hydrophone. Um, we generally provide the long period hydrophone, um, but a shorter period version is also available. Um, there's also options for APGs to be added as auxiliary sensors. And generally, the system is able to be deployed at depths of up to 6,000 meters. Uh, there is also a version that is rated to 4,000 meters. Next slide, please. I uh, should also mention that it's also compatible with GPSA and USB-L systems. Next slide, please. So just going to speak a little, <coughs> a little bit about the acoustic telemetry. Um, so when the Aquarius was originally designed, it was envisioned that this acoustic telemetry would mainly be used for uh, assessing the state of health of the instrument as it was deployed on the seafloor. Um, we quickly realized that we could then take this one step further uh, and make use of the telemetry to actually transfer um, seismic data whilst the free pool system was deployed. Um, so in the next slide, I'll explain a little bit more how this works um, because I'm sure many of you are aware there's a fine trade-off between preserving your battery life um, and transferring data in this situation. 
So it's envisioned that the data can be collected uh, via a dunker system, which can be used on a passing vessel or by some kind of um, more fixed infrastructure like a buoy system. Next slide, please. So in terms of transferring uh, seismic data during deployment, um, essentially the Aquarius uh, records a data calendar. Um, and within this table, you have um, date event stamps uh, that created when the center has a breach in its STA, LTA trigger algorithm. Uh, so this event table is then sent to the surface um, upon request. If you have a buoy system in place, this can be pinged up to the surface automatically. Um, it's then the decision of the operator to decide to request uh, the data packets that correspond to the events that have been detected. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Um, so in terms of installation and recovery, uh, on the right there, you've got a shot of, I believe, some of the initial testing we did um, off the coast of Sicily for the system. Um, so the acoustic telemetry can be used for uh, tracking the system as it actually descends to the seafloor. Um, and then once on the seafloor, the communications can be used to assess the state of health. So assessing that the center is working, um, assessing that the sensor has landed horizontally correctly, got good coupling. Um, if not, there's then the option for the operator to release the ballast um, and you can change the ballast um, on the vessel and redeploy if needed. Um, in terms of recovery, uh, the system comes with strobe LED lights, um, satellite tra tracking system, um, and the batteries inside the OBS um, are able to be charged very quickly. Um, this can be done on the, uh, the deck of the vessel. Um, so roughly speaking, one hour of recharge time um, equates to one month extra deployment time. Um, so it's envisioned that these can be turned around relatively quickly. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Just a, a short one. Um, giving uh, a little bit of an overview of the Aquarius OBS system. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. And sorry for the technical difficulties of um, no having time slides without knowing it. <laughs> that was me. Um, Megan, you had a question. Yes, hi. Um, thanks, James. That was really interesting. I've not heard of these before. Um, is there any... Um, restriction on the depth of water in which these operate efficiently? So the acoustic modem is rated to work down to the full 6,000 meters um, that the system is, is rated to. Um, so there, there haven't been any issues as far as I'm, I've heard so far of issues with depth um, and the communications. And, and also is it would this also alleviate an issue of um, the clock drift of OBSs that are left down for extended periods of time, like a year or more? Because I, is that, for example, um, as a global seismologist who would want to pick teleseismic travel times off OBS data to more than a second accuracy, um, clock drift would be an issue for that. So this would be, you would have the timestamp at quite a regular interval, so you would have an accurate time. Is that correct? Uh, yes, so I know that the, the acoustic modem can be used to, um, to resynchronize the, the clock of the, of the instrument as well. It works, uh, the communications work both ways. So as well as taking uh, the seismic data from the instrument, you can also send information to the instrument. So for resynchronizing the clock, for example, Great, thank you. All right, we got a couple of questions in the chat. One, um, just out of curiosity, how fast is super fast charging? <laughs> um, so as, as I mentioned, um, I don't know the, the exact rates um, off the top of my head, but generally speaking, one hour of 
charge time uh, equates to a month of deployment time. Um, there's obviously some caveats there with uh, how much you're using the acoustic modem, um, what auxiliary sensors are also on the instrument and how fast you're sampling those. Um, but generally speaking, one month of one hour of charge time equates to one month of deployment time. Thank you. And then another question, um, do you have any robotic underwater robotic aid development plan on install or retrieval or data retrieval? So um, Gural systems themselves, as far as I'm aware, we, we don't. Um, we have worked with, with partners who are trying to develop um, wave glider, automated wave glider systems um, that can be used for collecting data from Aquarius instruments um, whilst they're on the seafloor to try and automate the data collection process. Um, in terms of installation, um, we envisage these to be mainly, mainly free fall instruments. Um, so there shouldn't be any need for robotics in that sense, unless you want a, a super accurate um, deployment. Um, and we've had users in the past for other OBS systems use um, ROVs for the deployment phase. Thank you. Um, another question here, is there a sample rate limitation on the acoustic data retrieval? So the acoustic data retrieval, um, generally, so the, um, the data transmission limit is 9,000 uh, bits per second. Um, for the sake of um, saving battery life though, generally what we recommend is the transfer of between 10 and 15 uh, megabytes of data per month. Um, that's generally what we recommend if you want to keep your battery life between 12 to 18 months. But of course, it is possible to, to transfer more and your battery life would then just shorten. Great. Any last questions for James? I know we're kind of, once again, drifting into the instrumentation side and data, but they are so interlinked, it's hard to talk about one without the other. All right, seeing none, I think we will go ahead and move into the next phase of this special interest group meeting. But I do want to thank all of our presenters um, for joining us. I think everybody was a last minute addition, so you guys did great. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, post this link to some jam boards. If you've been in a SIG with me before, um, you'll know that I use these often just in order to get um, a bit more interaction uh, from, from folks who, who may not want to um, speak up uh, in these sessions, but who have very valuable perspectives to add. And so um, if you look at the link, I've put it in the Zoom as well as the event page chat, if you have any trouble um, joining that, I'll try to keep an eye out for any um, issues, but it looks like people are joining us and that you can um, join that with that link. Um, so as a, as a start, just uh, the way to use these Jamboards, if you've never used one before, I think you can yeah, see my screen here. Um, there's uh, this navigation here where you can go from frame to frame. Um, and navigate, you can see all of the frames here. So you can see what questions are coming up. Feel free to navigate if you'd like to, if your you know, attention is drifting and you'd like to answer a question in the, in the future, please feel free to. Um, we'll just be starting and kind of going together as a, as a group um, through these. One of the most easy ways to make a comment on here and get your feedback incorporated into this Jamboard is um, by making a sticky note. You click this little, um, icon here and then you can type in um, whatever you'd like, keep it short. Um, you'll see this little bar shows how long um, of a message you can fit on the sticky note. So it's kind of like tweeting, there's sort of a limit. Um, so I'll go ahead and say, you know, well, we certainly have data at the IRS DMC. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of how that, how Jamboards work. So, 
Um, if there's any questions along the way on using these, please let me know. But I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so as an easy question, um, first of all, it's just, you know, where, where are we storing our, our seafloor and marine geophysical data um, at present? Um, there's certainly more than the DMC, but I, I know that as we had a presentation from Jerry, that is a significant archive of, of OBS data um, that has been stored there. So if anyone, you know, feel free to add your own sticky notes if you want to talk about other archives that are available. Um, I do have a quick question just because I should know this, but um, at present, um, is there a any of this um, marine uh, geodetic data at the UNAVCO data archive? Or is it only land? To my knowledge, it's only land at this point. There is some uh, GNSS acoustic data at Levant's MGDS system. Okay. And there's C4, some C4 pressure data all associated with geoprisms that's at MGDS. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I should mention too, yeah, we do have pressure, seafloor pressure data um, archived at the DMC as well as uh, marine seismic. Right. I don't know if we have um, many active source uh, representatives here, but I know I think UTIG has their own system as well, right? Yeah, I should know the active source better than I do. I don't, it's a little bit confusing to me also that some stuff ends up at UTIG, some stuff ends up at MGDS, which for those who don't know is the Marine Geoscience Data System, currently located at Lamont. I think it, it's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of these OBS deployments are also associated with really nice high resolution multi-beam, for example. And so the data sets for those are also available from MGDS. Mm -hmm. And the other data that's at the DMC for, I think uh, it's certainly the Cascadia in instruments in the, in the ACE experiment in sometimes includes sea floor temperature. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's been archived in that format as well. And I'm sure our answers to these questions are going to be limited by the, the audience that we have and the participants we have here. But um, so we certainly don't want to pretend like this is a comprehensive list. But it does sound like, of course, we've got these public community data sets. Um, has anyone uh, worked with industry data that is perhaps stored but not available? So there are aspects of, of this data that I'm certain people in this room have used that are not publicly available, or either maybe on drives in your own office or, <laughs> or elsewhere. And I think one other thing I, I note just from my experience at, as part of the Cascadia initiative is there is data that is stored um, in the Navy uh, that is unfiltered and available upon request, but is not um, made publicly available based on um, their need to redact certain um, uh, times of, of um, possible Navy activity. All right, so we've got some archives um, and feel free to continue adding to those. Um, but within those archives, are there um, metadata or data products that are available um, in those archives um, related to marine data? Oops, oh, sorry, wait, is there? Okay, yeah, if, yeah, if anyone wants to transfer some of the things from the chat too, that would be great. Thank you for the folks who are participating in there. Um, so, so those kinds of data Products, I, I think um, Jim mentioned, you know, that can include something like um, uh, uh, the horizontal orientations of, of an OBS. Um, as as land seismologists, um, we expect that those to be would be measured and and made available in the metadata aggregator. Um, from the ocean side, that's not the same case, and so those do end up being a a um, product. 
depending on how which um, method you use to calculate those. So are there other metadata or metadata products that are available out there? I think OBSIC will have theirs soon. Let's add something here. <clears throat> I think, uh, not to put her on the spot here, but Helen, if you're out there, I know you've um, uh, talked about um, doing um, corrections to the data. And so um, hopefully you're out there or someone from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, I want to call it a metadata product that's available, but we are working on putting together a resource um, for people to be able to evaluate um, the like variation and tilt and compliance noise on these instruments. Um, and of course, there's the attacker package in, in MATLAB and Python that um, is available on GitHub um, for, uh, for people to apply tilt and um, compliance noise corrections to OBS instruments. Um, but yeah, it's not at the point where you could download um, pre-tilt and compliance corrected um, uh, seismic data. And I don't know if that's something that OBSIC themselves are, are working for, but yeah, stay tuned for more resources in that area, I guess. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a data product at this stage. Yeah, understandable. <laughs> you can put it on the next one, I think, which is what do we need? <laughs> So that can be one or the other. Maybe it falls in between. <laughs> um, great. Are there um, others since I'm not as, OK, there is one here, the process seismic reflection data contributed voluntarily to then GDS. It's a nice place to get images if you don't process these data yourselves. So exactly, that's exactly the kind of thing that's helpful. Um, are there any aspects of this in the geodetic side um, that would be uh, available now, or if they are not yet, you can add them to the next page where they need to be available. I, yeah, I, I guess I don't quite know how to answer that one because there, there are not metadata standards with a lot of C4 genetic data. Uh, there are clearly metadata products and several files that come out of the processing. So I, yeah. Don't know yeah. what to list there and it's sticky exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah. And I do apologize. These were questions uh, developed quickly and probably are not exactly the right ones to ask. So we can continue to answer that question in future jam boards. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and just um, quickly ask uh, the, the audience to, to add, add like what size um, data you're dealing with um, sort of when you're working on your projects here, um, you know, what is it, what's coming down the, down the pike that we need to be prepared to handle things that will give Jerry, you know, <laughs> sudden, <laughs> sudden heart palpitations. <laughs> um, is there, you know, sizes that we're going to have to deal with in the marine side? I'm sure there's someone here who's working on some sort of DAS related thing. I do see someone laughing, laughing emoji in the audience. So, <laughs> so you can feel free to add that. Um, do we have anyone from early warning or anyone who would be concerned about latency issues for marine geodetic capabilities? Perhaps not in this audience. I will go ahead and add. That as a potential use for that, <laughs> and they can fill that in later. Okay, well, we'll move on um, to our next uh, jam board. If you'd like to join me on the next one here, navigate via the arrow. What is, what is it that we need as a community? Um, in order to advance our research and um, knowledge and education in this um, field? What, um, 
what additional archives do we not have currently in our um, in our facilities that we may need in the future? I think on the geodetic side, there's a very obvious <laughs> answer to this. Maybe not obvious, but a, a very big need. <laughs> yeah, on the, on the geodetic side, there isn't an established database. Um, it's all ad hoc at this point. Um, but one one thing I don't know about is MT is maybe somebody can speak up of is there an obvious place where MT data is stored? Anyone from MT here? I don't think there is an obvious place where it is stored. I think. Uh, yeah, I, in some ways it may be, I can't speak for that community, but I just participated in a proposal where we talked about some of these things. Um, the raw data may be much less useful than some of the derived products is kind of my understanding of it, that the actual basic processing to go from the raw time series to the transfer functions or, or however, I'm not sure exactly what they would describe as the basic data to be archived, but I think it is more of a processed data set than a raw data set, but that might be splitting hairs. I think that's true, Jim, that most of it that come that at least that we get the the processed is the, the data products are more important for the community than the raw data, although we do keep the raw data as well. Okay, so I guess there's a question here. Sorry, I'm just getting a note um, from Robert Weekly. Does training and recapitalization of new instrumentation factor into what's needed moving forward, physical infrastructure? I think that, is that related to the archive, Rob? Do you wanna elaborate? Uh, yeah, it just kind of sounded like that was uh, a big point that was made during uh, Jim Garrity's talk is that we have some new funding, it sounds like, for to have the instrumentation, but being able to utilize it, have expertise in it, have a maintenance schedule for it seemed still to be a little bit vague and nebulous and, you know, uh, unsure of what that kind of process and what that structure looks like moving forward. So it sounds like there's there's a need, if we're going to focus on providing the service uh, for researchers or for educators, then it seems to me kind of obvious that we would need to have uh, people trained up and, um, you know, just subject matter experts, so to, so, so to speak in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that, that could all kind of come under the umbrella of the archive, I suppose, but uh, there, there is uh, some hard skills here that I think um, we need to make sure to call out explicitly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I've seen some other comments coming in here. If you'd like to elaborate on any of the things that you're adding here, I think um, I'm just gonna call out this one here on, um, on the seafloor geodetic community uh, reaching consensus on metadata standards. So I did um, attend, I think it was a, a breakout or a special interest group meeting like that at the um, April, April workshop on um, the geodetic side. And I do know, yes, the metadata side was, um, was kind of a question mark at that time. And so uh, anyone who else was in there or working on the report want to sort of comment on the status of that? Is it um, that there are many different directions and, and strong opinions to go in different directions on this, depending on the application of, of the data, or is it that there just hasn't been, like, is there any reason to uh, deviate strongly from the land geodetic metadata standard? Yeah, so for um, like GNSSA, there are more data files, different data types that come along with that data that need to be 
partitioned and explained and, and um, you know, the Japanese uh, will use a different metadata standard for their data than what's been done in the US. And so we really need uh, a, a workshop to bring people together to kind of agree upon what the file type should be, what the metadata should be uh, for all these different data types. And it goes along with some C4 pressure data too of um, as we get these different calibrated pressure gauges, uh, having that metadata to explain the equipment needs to be included. So from the seismic side, um, given that we've got some metadata standards that have been agreed upon in, in the OBS community and, and active source communities, um, I wasn't there at the beginning of when those were being established, but are there any, is there any advice to offer on how, how those were, were brought about? For instance, putting the zeros in for orientation instead of um, providing a calculated orientation. I think it does point to once we start providing calculated orientations. I mean, there were always a uncertainties in our orientations, even with the GSN, at least prior to you guys buying whatever that crazy instrument is you orient instruments with now. But you know, there's always uncertainty when you measure, even when you measure north with a compass. Um, and that's never really been captured. And I think people never really worried about that too much. But certainly as you start, I think for you know many uh, Casey can comment, maybe many of the Cascadia stations were not able to be oriented. And so you have a spectrum of things that you have really nice, clean, you know, using your Rayleigh wave or your ambient noise or whatever tool you're using, you have some nice clean observations that maybe gives you some statistical estimate of what that uncertainty is to something that really is very, very uncertain to the point where you can't really even decide to, to include that. And um, there really is no mechanism to communicate that to users. And so, um, you know, we, we sort of, we often try to put reports in with these kinds of data sets and things like this, but unless you know to look for those things, you, you have no real mechanism to, to get at that information. And, you know, at some level, even depth of the instrument is uncertain within some amount. And if you use the acoustic travel times versus the multi-beam, you know, depth estimate, then you get different numbers. And so um, it, is, it is true that our seismic metadata does not include uncertainty. Yes, having um, error bars in that metadata information uh, was something that we had discussed as part of um, the expansion of station um, XML uh, metadata. So, um, and of course that, that can then be translated to error bars and location error bars and depth exactly like you said. So, um, Helen, you've got a comment. Yeah, I was just gonna briefly add on to that. You know, the other subtle thing and this relates back to the, the tilt and compliance correction issue is that there are subtle variations in the way you can do some of these calculations in terms of the frequencies that you're using, in terms of you know what data you're using to, to calculate these um, metadata or corrected data uh, products, um, subtle differences in um, uh, all these you know choices that the user has to make has to make. Um, and so there's a distinction between the experienced OBS user who knows about this and knows that even if they see a data product that was calculated a certain way that has high uncertainty, but maybe because of these instrument properties, they could use a different technique that isn't the standard one that the DMC is providing and maybe get a better answer. Um, and I don't know what the right way is to, you know, balance this level of using a somewhat standard technique to just provide a product for like the average user in the community versus still communicating that complexity as people um, become more experienced uh, users and to um, 
uh, avoid the situation where there's still, you know, this gulf between um, the people who just trust like the numbers that are in the DMC versus the people who know about um, uh, much, have much more in-depth knowledge about the, the different ways you could be um, uh, potentially uh, applying some of these calculations and corrections. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it, it does seem that we just need to be cognizant of how, as we move to presenting more of these like data product style things, how do we also still um, provide that level of education for people to be continuously, uh, you know, questioning and improving on those techniques as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. It does go into the education side of things as well, of just um, making sure people are aware of those subtleties. Um, if you've always been using the global seismographic network and are now wanting to delve into OBS data, you know, there's going to be some a bit of a learning curve, but the more we can make that learning curve flattened out or support it will certainly help. So training data sets for new users, absolutely. Um, and of course that goes into those community-wide data sets too. So, so Cascadia was um, the first that uh, um, data set to have orientations, horizontal orientations calculated for it as a, as a data product and reported as part of that community data set. And then um, that has led now into that being offered as a, as a product for the OBSIC community. Um, I have a question. I want to, if I can ask a question to put Helen on the spot again. Um, <laughs> Always. I'm curious whether, I mean, if, if we actually say OPSIC move forward with a program to, to actually try to implement tilt and compliance corrections, actually doing that to all the data streams, it would only be one additional data stream per station, but it would still be the full sample rate data stream being reproduced for that station because you would still want to offer the raw data as well. And so I was curious your thoughts on whether it would be possible to calculate one transfer function or a limited number of transfer functions that could be offered as the data product that then users with a clear instructions on how to actually apply that to the data. And so you wouldn't actually be duplicating the data in the DMC and it wouldn't be up to the DMC to make choices on how to filter and those kinds of things. Once, once a transfer function is created, then you know users could still recreate it if they wanna to try to do it better but there would be at least a baseline transfer function that could be used. And I, I'm curious your thoughts on whether say one transfers function for an entire year's worth of data would be sufficient to provide a significant improvement on data quality. Yeah, so I think um, we don't 100% know the answer to that question, but I, I do think that is a better way of doing it. Um, you know, for example, there's this difference of applying it traditionally at this like lower than 10 second bands, which is where you know, people have been applying transfer functions to do these corrections, but then there's also people applying it in the ambient noise band. Um, and there's an area where in between that you generally can't correct and you want to take that out. And so just applying that correction, uh, applying that, giving people that transfer function allows them to pick whatever frequency band they want to apply it to, depending on what type of analysis they want to subsequently do, which makes a lot more sense to me. The only caveat is that we do have good evidence um, from Bell et al with the Cascadia data, as well as we're seeing it more elsewhere that um, these transfer functions are not always consistent um, throughout an entire deployment. Um, and the most obvious one is when you see the tilt transfer function actually subtly changing orientation over time, um, uh, either with instrument re-leveling or who knows what else. Um, and so there's other more subtle things that we're starting to see too with um, where the relative strength of the tilt and compliance um, values seem to shift over time, which, you know, traditionally tilt gets removed first and then compliance because tilt is assumed to be the higher noise source. Um, uh, Tian and Ritzwaller pointed this out that there's some stations where that's not true for Cascadia. And that seems as we look more and more and more that there's more and more stations um, that, that also have that issue. I don't know the answer right now in like that myriad of scenarios, what the best transfer function is um, if and how much it really winds up mattering um, for uh, giving good enough corrected data for most people's uses. And so I think those 
questions would need to be answered along the way um, to figure out what is like just the amount that we need to care about this um, for uh, giving a, a, a data product that we want to push to the community. Um, but I think those are questions that could be answered. Um, and so that would be the checklist that I'd start with. Great, thanks for that. And um, before we move on, is there any um, notes that people would like to speak to here on this Jamboard before we move on to the next one. Whoever just posted something on the platform for or test bed for testing and benchmarking new instrument designs in the seafloor, absolutely. It's something that's never really been done um, even with the, the older instruments. And, and it would be, I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the best ways to design both in terms of things with interacting with currents to yeah stability stability of the instruments themselves and how well they level all kinds of, of unanswered questions associated with that so it would be great to move into a framework where we could do that mm -hmm. Ellen. i just also posted the baseline catalogs and i just wanted to point it out because i think it literally very much complements um, the baseline instrument testing, right? So, you know, if we're going to be doing that, we also need to kind of understand um, what the, you know, range of variability that we've already seen is. And so I think those two hand in hand would be really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm starting to think of like even that recent article that came out of um, weird wiggles or something like that of seismogram, seismograms gone wrong of <laughs> just trying to explain what things can look like on on seismometers um, and having having that kind of information for marine data is so key because there's um, just you know a whole different world of environmental things um, instrumental all kinds of things that can manifest in data to confuse new users so very good points All right, I think I'll go ahead and move on. I mean, some of these are, might be a little bit repetitive, but I do think um, delving a little bit into sort of the more specifics of, of this kind of um, metadata needed in our fields um, uh, in order to describe this data and make it usable to, to additional users. Um, what, what kind of um, metadata do we need to be reporting in order to and, and capturing and so what what do we need to have um, uh, containers for at, at the DMC or at other archives in order to capture that information and I can just get started with one which was you know I mentioned that Navy Navy redacted data we did have to come up with a um, a standard in metadata the channel naming convention in order to indicate uh, whether data was was filtered um, or redacted by the Navy and what wasn't. And so um, by indicating an X in the center character, that was the, um, the filtered, Navy filtered data. And so that was a standard that was then sort of incorporated into the OBS um, world um, for data standards. But um, obviously a, a kind of a simple question that needed to have a standard associated with it. Um, I know that this uh, current sticky that's up here, the ability to indicate changing lats longs, removing drifting sensors in the metadata. Certainly this is, um, has been brought up in the mermaid uh, instruments, which we've referenced, but I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with them, but they're the free floating um, instruments that uh, can capture seismic waves uh, through the water column, or um, also just drifting around and landing on the seafloor. I think there's others that that have hopped along the seafloor. That sort of thing has happened. So Helen. Something like the mermaids, I'm guessing that that's really, you know, just travel time information that people are going to be using that amplitudes of something that is a water, a wave that's in the water is going to be very different, right? I think. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering, you know, as if we're moving towards all of these data types being more accessible, which I think my mind goes to 
more people, um, you know, just kind of blindly downloading the data and incorporating them in with like GSN or other data sets um, or perhaps local onshore deployments. Um, how do we make sure that things like, you know, perhaps wildly different wild differences in say amplitude information or just you know even at things as simple as like issues with instrument response functions and gains that still pop up every now and then um how do we make sure that um people who are looking to incorporate this data seamlessly with on land data um don't run into those problems and maybe this is like jumping ahead to the next one i'm sorry but yeah okay yeah no it's a it's a important thing um you know yeah i know metadata might not be the right word and maybe i'm using it very broadly to mean literally anything that's not just the data itself but um you know that that's going to be important for making these data sets available and and useful uh, for people and making sure that we're avoiding um misinterpretation of results, which is huge. So yes, I think um, we've got really good standards so far on the seismic side. And I know that I don't want to have to make them repeated every time, but the Siebler geodesy side is obviously going to be working on these metadata standards um, in their future, future work here. Any other comments, questions? This is uh, Rob. Is there anything particularly particularly unique about the marine ge geophysical instrumentation that we should take note of for uh, future possibly sensor ML based, um, you know, addendum to uh, to metadata that would uniquely describe those the instruments and, and their surroundings as opposed to um, you know, the traditional terrestrial instrumentation. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, one thing that just comes to mind is like their leveling system. I, you know, not, I don't know if that's actually incorporated into information about the stations currently. And some of these, systems are quite um, different from each other. So any thoughts on that from someone who, it's been a while since I've worked with this kind of data. So apologies if I'm a little rusty. And do we have anyone from the insight team too because you know since we're thinking of things that are not just terrestrial <laughs> they could be extraterrestrial as well as marine um i know that that was that was brought up with this ability to change lats and longs um as they were collecting data from the insight seismometer along its journey to mars before it was installed installed itself. <laughs> so perhaps we can work with with that side of seismology as well. Is, um, oh, is the temperature and salinity of the water at all a coupling factor with the ocean bottom seismometers? This is just from a, a lay person who doesn't understand. So certainly um, temperature is something that has been collected as one of the data channels um, in some of the deployments that have been done um, in order to have that data on hand for, for any interpretation of results. Um, I have not heard of salinity being collected. Or how that would be incorporated.
I mean, I'm even thinking just very simple things too. Like there's, you know, OBSs that we know landed upside down. Like we don't <laughs> currently, I think, have a way of capturing that um, in the metadata, as far as I know, aside from a comment or a report. Or a, or a dip reversal in the metadata. Yes, I don't, yeah, and that's, I don't know, anyone who remembers that Cascadia instrument, if that was, um, I think it was a Cascadia instrument. We had them in ACE too, we had one, I think. I'm not sure there was any good data that came from it. It does raise an interesting question that we had for, for the, one of the recent Pacific Array deployments, we had a large number of instruments where the sensor ball drop process failed. And a large amount of that data is recorded hanging from the arm. The seismometer recorded lots of data or the data logger recorded lots of sensor data. Um, and for the most part, you wouldn't find anything that you would try to analyze on that, but not, not necessarily. Ambient noise, for example, the peak of the microseism does manage to come through. And um, you actually can, can, for P waves in particular, you, you do, see for big earthquakes you do see something and you probably would want to know even if you're going to try to use that data you probably would want to know that it was hanging and so you know we have a we have a, a paper that's in i think we just got reviews back for a data what do they call data mine srl paper that if you know of that paper then there's all kinds of details on which stations had that problem and when but you know there's no way to include that in the metadata in any way mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think in the marine um, community, there's been a lot of um, value in producing cruise reports that have that kind of information. I mean, those have been just, you know, gold mines of information if you're working with a new data set. Um, but of course, it's a cruise report that is produced when you're on the cruise and um, there's significant amount of information that is discovered after the fact. Um, and while working with the data um, on land <laughs> with um, non-boat brain. Um, so I think capturing that kind of information has always been difficult, um, particularly when it involves something like updating metadata. Um, so uh, having a process in order to do that or, or having a process to capture that information, perhaps that's through those data mine articles. I know that it's been um, quite valuable for the seismic uh, community. And this isn't, you know, limited just to marine. I know that on land, because they haven't had a cruise report, a lot of that information has not been reported. And so they're, they're working on aspects of getting that information collected and shared. We may need to come up with a standard on how to store provenance and, you know, like what happened to the data? Are these data products? Were these data filtered in any way? So any transformations that occurred to the data before they were stored in their final data archive? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, I think that that's going to be definitely an area that needs to be um, developed further. As I said, we had a channel naming convention to indicate Navy filtering of seismic data, um, but communicating what that meant was maybe not necessarily done in the most effective manner. You know, it, it's once again transferred in reports and word of mouth and presentations. So at least a big X in a channel name should, should get some attention. Helen. I would just add one thing that I think is pretty different about um, the ability to record any sort of data issues uh, with an offshore experiment versus an onshore one is that often one offshore is like a very big step change um, in environment compared to onshore. There's and, and not just the fact that there's water over the instrument, right? You know, they can be very different um, characteristics in how much uh, sediment the instruments are lying over, just quality of coupling, things like that. Um, and also, it's often those are the 
only instruments there. Whereas, you know, an onshore um, deployment, um, you know, you might have a, a denser PI driven deployment deployment that, that could have had some sort of a systematic instrumentation issue with it. But then there's also, you know, other networks that overlap or are close to those instruments. And so if something's systematically wrong, you can assess it by looking at nearby instruments. Those things probably don't exist for a lot of offshore experiments. And so if there's something subtle um, wrong with the data, like a systematic amplitude issue or something like that, um, it strikes me that it'll be much more difficult to address particularly, um, again, for any users who are just automatically loading in this data for a process um, and who might not be focused only on that data set and thus didn't spend the time reading the cruise report and going through like, you know, the finding this information in like PDF form. I mean, the cruise reports are great, but you know, you have to spend the time reading them. Um, you know, that is not something that is automatically associated with the metadata or makes it easy for people in any way, particularly if they are doing something where the scientific goal is not really tied to that specific cruise. So I would, I would say like, yes, this is stuff that um, plagues all seismic deployments in some way. Um, but I would argue that it's a little bit more difficult to, um, I, it could be more difficult to um, diagnose in a straightforward and automatic way than with onshore deployments. And so I think we should think that um, not making people sift through PDFs as much as possible in my mind is a good thing. Yeah, agree. <laughs> as much as it's nice to have the information somewhere, you know, I think we can move on to um, to advance that a little further, um, which I think someone has just captured that as cruise reports, but machine readable. So being able to somehow translate that into the archive itself, um, perhaps along with that idea of data provenance and what has happened to this data. Someone here has also indicated, yeah, with whether the clock drift was corrected and I mean, my own heart palpitation, leap seconds, Ugh, leap seconds are the worst and trying to um, navigate, do you correct it? Do you not correct it? How do you indicate if it's been corrected is such a nightmare and it's for one second of a year of data and it can cause so many problems. So keeps me up at night for sure. Jim? For the, for the lack of a clock correction, we do generally t flag all of that mini seed data as uncertain timing. So it is in there generally, um, but you actually have to know to look for that. And many, you know, many of your standard codes will just pull the data out and not really, uh, not really alert you to that, so. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about clock error though, Jim? Like to how off, how far off are the, are they like seconds or fractions of seconds? Um, generally fractions of seconds. So, so the, the, the way we do it is you, you get a good timestamp at the beginning of your time series and you get a good timestamp at the end. And, you know, I think is in uh, James's- it's the beginning and the end being a year apart, right? For, yeah, a year apart for, for a broadband data set, it may be a month apart for a, a short period data set. So it's all done the same way. Um, the, that is based on a linear drift assumption, which we know is not a great assumption because basically the clock, the reason it drift, the main reason for clock drift is temperature variations. Um, so in particular, that linear assumption would be pretty uncertain at the early in the experiment because that's when the largest nonlinearity is. But then towards the end of the experiment, it's probably not too far off. Um, the, I, well, I say that actually there's a nonlinearity at both ends, but um, it, I think it takes a little time for, as, as, assuming you get your correction pretty quickly, then um, the, the, the end, we sort of assume the end part is probably pretty reasonable. Um, and that amount of drift over a full year for a working clock will generally be a few hundred milliseconds. 
right? So it's not a huge amount of time that you're having to, 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 to um, correct that drift for. Um, and yeah, and, and certainly for broadband applications, that's generally good enough. There are tools now to try to evaluate those clock corrections. I mean, we actually use them to apply a clock correction for instruments where the clock does fail. If you have timing that's good on some nearby instruments and then timing that's bad, you can do cross correlations between those instruments and track the cross correlation timing as a function of time. And you can infer, you very often will see a clear drift of one instrument relative to another one. And so you can use the one with good timing to get the bad timing. And it's again, a derived product that has some uncertainty associated with it, but it's at least to first order, not that different than what you actually infer from the, from the drift calculation itself. So in some ways it's, there's a little bit of a circular reasoning there that we actually use the drift corrected data where we assume that, where we measure the endpoints and assume the drift. But when we look at the drift that we see on the seafloor in general, using this cross correlation technique, that drift does look pretty linear over the time scale of a year. And so that linearity assumption we don't think is too bad. The, the clocks are getting better nominally. There are these new atomic based clock systems that would actually have significantly less drift inherently in them. And there's been some hiccups in implementing those. We thought we had them running, we bought a bunch of them. They turned out to not be running so well. And so there was a little bit of a step back. I think those have continued to stabilize power consumption has gone down on them. And so they're more able to be used more broadly. And, and, um, and so I think there's some hope that in some ways this problem becomes much, much less of an issue in the future, assuming the clock works, that it actually will be a, a clock with, with significantly less drift than the, the older, the older uh, models. Okay, cool, thank you. And this might be naive, but is that the same issue that um, the geodesists also need to be concerned about for seafloor? Or they're using wave gliders, so they're they don't have to deal with clocks being an issue. Well, um, so GNS GNSS uses clocks as a fundamental principle. So yeah, the clocks are important, but we're using it all from the satellite, so we don't have to worry about local time. Yeah, must be nice. <laughs> Okay, well, in the interest of time, I would like to at least get to this question, this next one um, here, which I think is has been brought up a couple of times already and in, in our conversations, but um, you know, there are currently some significant sort of barriers um, in order to use both um, marine data and land data or you know, to move between these two communities. Um, within our, our own communities. And so um, what are those kinds of barriers that still exist, um, particularly on the data side? Um, you know, is it just that they're in different archives? Is it um, understanding that there are these, these potential areas of, of um, uncertainty in their data, in your instrumentation? Um, what kinds of barriers do exist? And then, and then how, how can we do a better job of bridging that between our community, particularly on the data side? And this is really kind of aimed at also, you know, continuing to make sure that our communities are, are healthy, that we're, we're developing, we're growing our user bases, which will be a very important part in order to have successful proposals for that new instrumentation. And I think that this is a, an age old solution to these kinds of problems is like, let's do another gigantic experiment. Let's do a huge project where we do bring in people who are interested in um, a very compelling science problem um, and producing a community data set that is open and available. Uh, so I think that that's what this um, uh, sticky note on the subduction zone um, combining um, 
episodic tremor and slip and, and offshore. I don't know if that's actually been, I know that's a question. So if anyone has the answer to that question, feel free to speak up. Besides, obviously the Cascadia Initiative was a very clear example of trying to bring together the land and marine communities to target a specific science goal. Anyone from SC4D want to comment on how easy or difficult it has been to bring those communities together? Maybe there's an SC4D session right now. I'm not actually <laughs> aware. All right, we've got some other responses here coming into those barriers. Um, identifying and correcting for oceanographic signals in the data that are the primary noise source. Certainly, I know this has been a has been brought up that OBSs are too noisy. They're, you can't do work with them. But of course, if you talk to people like Helen, <laughs> they will inform you that no, in fact, you can actually get very good signals from those. So, um, some communication in, in what's needed in order to make that data um, more useful for those traditional land applications. This is a big one. Um, not sure if we have anyone from NSF in, in the audience, um, but um, having, um, well, NSF and other agencies, of course, having different agencies managing the marine and land seismic programs um, has, been, has been an issue for, for obtaining funding for these kinds of initiatives and projects. Any thoughts on how we can better strategize and address that one in particular of um, navigating our, our funding agencies? I think demonstrated use is obviously a big one. How many land, traditionally land seismologists are using ocean data. I'll just comment that I think, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's actually been happening in a really um, relatively effective way over the last decade that more and more traditional land seismologists have, have been exploring the data that's available on OBSs and trying to make use of it. And that's led to this growth that Jerry pointed out in, in the, or maybe he pointed out the archive of the data, but I think uh, there are similar slides that you could show in terms of the number of users of that data has also increased dramatically. And so um, I, I feel like part of the difficulty, I, I, you know, every, certainly every program manager I've ever worked with at NSF in both marine geology and geophysics so on the ocean scientist side and in the geophysics side and LVAR have been really supportive of my research and the questions that we're trying to address are often relevant to both of those programs and so you know for certain projects is one that might be better than the other and that's who we go to for funding and so I think at the program manager level there's a broad appreciation of the science that we're doing with these kinds of data sets regardless of whether they the data came from the water side of the line or the land side of the line. I think where the breakdown happens is when, say, OCE writes a report on the things that are important to them. You know, so the the uh, what was it called? The Sea Changes Report is now I don't know six years old or something, but it's the most recent one the OCE did, and um, they had you know, the large earthquake and tsunami problem is one of their top five scientific problems. But at the same time, they rank things like the marine seismic facilities as very low priority for ocean sciences as a whole. And I think it's in part because the broad community that's really making use and doing that science spans this much broader range. They're, they're not the traditional OCE community. Some number of us are sitting on, you know, might put ourselves on that side, but many put themselves on the other side of a of that line and more think of themselves as in the geophysics kind of traditional community. And 
Um, I don't think that the higher level people in NSF really appreciate the breadth of that, the breadth of people within NSF that are taking advantage of this facility, for example, this, this one being an example of it. And you could say the same thing from the AAR side. There's, you know, the, the facilities that IRIS provided provides benefit communities well beyond the traditional, you know, geophysics community that came together to build it. And so um, I don't quite understand how we haven't communicated that better to the structures upstairs at NSF. It's kind of like a geo level thing would be really nice to get more support for these kinds of things that really span divisions. It seems like it should be a good, you know, interdisciplinary science is a good thing broadly. You know, we're expected to do it in our own proposals and our own science, but somehow we can't get NSF to actually do it at their level. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I think we just need to keep working on it. I, I sort of hope that SC4D will, as it coalesces and is such a exciting and compelling project, it forces them to build a structure that actually, you know, funds things in a more cohesive way across between the two divisions, contributing in a way that is way more flexible and, and more interactions than happen now, certainly in, in the programs that I've been involved in. Sorry about that. This is a little bit of a no. box issue for me. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's it's an important one because I don't see it um, getting any easier as um, as we continue to expand the user base um, of of marine data. There will be people who maybe aren't the traditional marine seismologists or marine geodesists. They're using the data that's freely available and, and um, well-documented and has the right metadata and all that in their research, but they aren't sitting on those panels or you know, working in that community, that traditional marine community. And so how, how can we capture that value of that data and, and show it? <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting, Jim, that when I sit in these Zoom rooms, I hear a lot of what you're saying, like, there's this impression that EAR and OCE don't talk to each other or coordinate very well. Yet when I talk to the people at NSF, they're like, we talk all the time. <laughs> so there's a cognitive I, dissonance. Here. I, I think that I, I, you know, I agree. I think I, and I think, they think they're doing I, great. <laughs> I think, I think at the program manager level, they probably really are doing. I mean, I mean, there's no question that the people involved in the geoprisms program, for example, have been doing this for years. Um, but the money that the comes to level. them, they don't they don't control what comes to them. And that's it's it's that structure above that seems to really, you know, the OBS program is entirely funded within ocean sciences, marine geology, and physics program. And it's not even a facility, unlike IRIS, for example, it's not, it is in the science budget for marine geology and geophysics. And so they have to choose to support this thing at the same time that they're evaluating proposals to go do real science, to go do the science. And I think that without some change in the, the, the money coming to them, then it's very hard for them to, to, to sort of break down this barrier. It really is a, you know, the really nice NSF report that was reported on yesterday in the last session of the day on the AAR side, that had the title NSF's geophysical facilities and it does not it's entirely an eAR product and an entirely an eAR evaluation and it didn't mention anything about any of the facility the, what we've been talking about for the last two hours because that's not in their purview and that's nothing that the program managers themselves can individually change hey you know what that could be an idea though what if what if we just think big what if this new unified geophysical facility covered land and ocean? Wouldn't that be an idea? Think big. Absolutely. And I think that um, as this community grows and develops, um, obviously we're going to be growing together and, <laughs> and there will be a lot of opportunities to learn from each other, learn best practices, learn how to develop these communities further. So, and yeah, interdisciplinary uses of data um, I think uh, I'll just uh, plug uh, earthquake early warning again as as another sort of tie to the land that we we can um, incorporate our communities even further in in that application as well. Same with uh, tsunami characterization and and so on. And so um, 
perhaps USGS can get involved in that. No, uh, <laughs> let's bring in more agencies. Maybe that'll help, right? <laughs> Okay, well, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. We are at uh, four o'clock somehow. <laughs> we managed to continue discussing this whole time. So I, I really appreciate everyone's uh, contributions, uh, both in the presentations and in the discussion. I know we didn't get to all the questions. So if you do want, I'll leave this Jamboard open uh, for the next um, hour uh, during the break. And um, you can continue to add, edit, um, improve your comments <laughs> in any way. And I'll put together a report for, for this SIG based on uh, the comments that we discussed today. So thank you again. Round of applause to the speakers and participants. And I would encourage you to come back at 5 o'clock for our last uh, session. Thank, thank you. you, Casey. Thanks for organizing.